Speak to my heart, Lord. Give me your holy word. If I can hear from you, you know it, then I know what to do. I won't go alone. I'll never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide me. Yes. And let your word say, speak to my heart and speak. To, sing to him, give me your holy word. If I can hear from you, then I know what to do. I won't go alone. Never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide me. Let the word abide in me. Speak to my heart, Lord, and speak to my heart, Lord. Give me your holy word. If I can't hear from you, I know what to do. I won't go alone. No, no, never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide me. Let your word abide in me. One more time. Speak to my heart, Lord. Say it. Speak to my heart. Give me your holy word. If I can't hear, know what to do. I won't go alone. I'll never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide me. Let your word abide. Speak to my heart, Lord. I'm open, Father. I'm open. I'm open. I want to hear from you. And if I can't hear, then I know what to do. I won't go alone. I'll never go, never go on my own. Let your spirit guide me. Let your word abide. Psalm 119 and 9 says, uh, 119 and 11, you know what it says. I have hidden your word in my heart. So I shall not sin against God. 19 to 103 says, How sweet are your words to me, to my feet, to my taste, sweeter than the honey on my mouth. And then he goes on to say, 105, 119, 105, your word is an apple to my feet, a light unto our path. Here's a lovely passage. Jot it down in your mind. Hold on to it. 119 and 125 says, I am your servant. Give me discernment to understand your truth. Father, we thank you for the spirit of discernment this morning as we read your word. We will hear clearly from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Clap your hands one more time. Give God a great praise. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So many things that I want to say to you this morning. We're going to go ahead and jump into the word, though, but make sure parents... I want you to know that um, on Wednesday nights, bring your students. Don't forget to bring your students. They're going through the study of practical theology, uh, everyday theology. So they're having a great time with our student ministry. Um, so we celebrate that, what God is doing there. You know, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians. Have you been enjoying 1 Corinthians? I pray it's been a battle axe cutting all of us to and fro. As we are learning what God did in the life of this uh, first century church there in Corinth. Um, so we're in chapter number nine today. Chapter number nine. Say that's a good one. Chapter nine. Can we give God thanks for our band and singers, for singer McKenzie, our media team. Um, parents, if you want your child to go to OC, wonderful kids, you can release them now. Um, Sister Nikhil is standing there waving her hand. She's ready to... to to spend some time with your lovely child. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much, so much. We have so much to be thankful for. I'm glad to see April and, and James here this morning. They were getting over COVID and look at them in the house, oh Lord, this morning. Bless your bones. Good to see you. Uh, pray for Team Green. The Green kids are uh, going through the COVID and strep throat, but they're doing better now. Uh, we're glad to see Jockey this morning. Jockey's grandmother went home to be with the Lord. Uh, a moment to celebrate and remember great memories of a wonderful woman. So we celebrate that with you, Jockey. Are we there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9? And everybody else, it's good to see you. Good to see your eyes this morning. Good to see your eyes this morning. 
Uh, so we're here, um, as you know, last week we were looking at this and we were under the topic of the problem with a um, arrogant church. Um, so we're actually going to start with verse number, the last verse of uh, chapter 8 to take us into chapter number 9 um, when we get there. Um, and so to start, I want to... I wanna, probe your minds real quick. Do you all remember the story? Uh, it's a tale about a pig and a chicken. You ever remember the old story about a, a pig and a chicken? How the pig and the chicken got together one morning for breakfast, right? And so the chicken looked at the pig and the pig looked at the chicken. And they said, what are you offering for your part of breakfast today? The chicken said, I'll give you a couple of eggs. The pig had to stop and think about it. Because the only thing the pig had to offer was himself. So the, the, the chicken was willing to be involved. But the pig had to be fully committed. Let me put this on all to your heart this morning that we are amongst a bunch of people in our world today who call themselves Christians that love to be involved but have not fully committed themselves to the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be involved. We'll have our names on the roll and be recognized for certain things but when it comes to full commitment you know, we, we, we're on a real hard bus right there because to be fully committed is to give all you have all the time. Yeah. Anybody can be involved. All you got to do is sign your name or, or, or write your name somewhere and they consider you a part of the team. But if you're really going to be a part of the team, you got to be willing to do some work to show thyself worthy of being on the team. So I have to add, don't look at anybody, look at me. Are you committed or are you, you satisfied with being involved? You see, we're going to look at this episode here in chapter 9 where Paul talks about his full commitment. As we look at chapter 8 on last week, we're talking about um, personal and spiritual um, um, freedoms. Paul uses himself in chapter 9 as a great example of what it really looks like to offer oneself up for full commitment. To even have the opportunity to take in what should be his by right, but he says no for the cause of the kingdom. He was willing to be fully committed and not just involved. Look at me, don't get away. Some of us are involved in marriages. They're not fully committed though. Look at me, don't get away. Look at look at me. Some of us are in relationships with people on our jobs, other family members that we're just involved with but not fully committed. And I believe in my heart of hearts that God is calling for all his declared sons and daughters to be fully committed. So we're going to talk this morning from the subject of the problems with a cheap church. Problems with a cheap church. Uh, so please lock that down and ask yourself this question for the rest of the week. Am I committed or am I involved? <laughs> and I'm not just talking about the church. I'm talking about the capital C, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I fully vetted in this fellowship with God? Or am I satisfied with just being involved with him? You do know your, your fellowship with God has to move from being a fellowship to a relationship. Some of us are have, it's, it's a sad picture, y'all. We're going to jump in here, but sad picture is that many of us in the Christian church today, we, we are just satisfied with not going to hell. <laughs> and not really committed to be engaged with God. I try to back back and I say it again. Some of us just glad we're not going to hell. As we're going through all this, just keep from going to hell. There's more to being saved than not going to hell. All right. Okay, 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 okay. So look at the pastors with me. Look at verse back to chapter number eight. And let's start reading at verse number nine. He says this, be careful, however, that, that, the, that the exercise of your rights does not 
uh, become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? Verse 11, so this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by, everybody say, your knowledge. knowledge. 12 says, when you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. I'll never do it again so I don't cause my brother or my sister to fall. It's, 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 it's crucial for, I believe, for the American Christian church here in America for us to make a better decision. We've got to make a better decision. It has to be uh, less about us looking a certain way, acting a certain way, if we're not looking and acting in the place of our Savior. Because many people can look the part. But our hearts are very far away from who God is. Yeah. And what God is speaking to all of us. See, we, we, we claim Christ as Messiah, yet we still live messy. How we use God's blessings and we forego and forget about the blesser. How we carry, we wave a banner of saving lives, yet we pick and choose which lives we save. We, we've got to make better decisions as, the, as, as God's body that we don't just wave a flag of a political party, but we wave the flag of being a Christian. That's who we are. That we're not just caught up in our skin color. Black and I'm proud. Well, that's cool. I'm white and I'm proud. That's cool. Who cares, though? If we have accepted Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we are Christians first. So that means all these other things are superfluous. They matter not to the big scheme of things. Do you not understand that in a hundred years, nobody would even know you lived here? And yet we put everything we have in making a name for ourselves. We got to make some better decisions. This is my prayer that we all will learn from this first Corinthian church what it means to be cheap so that we don't become cheap. 15 things from this passage. I'm just joking. So here we are, verse number one says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, indeed I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to eat food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing um, wife along with us? As do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? All right, so here we go. Look, look, look at your neighbor and say, don't be cheap. So here's the first thing you have to with. If you don't deal with this, there's a thing called cheap respect. Cheap respect. So uh, it, uh, cheap respect is the idea of having false admiration for a person or thing or place. Cheap respect is to see someone and partly respect them for a position, yet not respect them as a person. And I say it says partly as in a position, but not respect them as a person. Look at the litany of questions that, that, that Paul addresses in asking in this letter, Am I not an apostle? Yeah. Now we all understand, 
that Paul had an encounter with Christ. In order to be an apostle, the person, the person had to experience Jesus. So John, you know, you read it when you get home, Acts chapter 9, Christ came in, uh, um, excuse me, Paul had an encounter with Christ, right? Yeah. Traveling, and so he saw a light, knocked him off his horse, kept him blind so he could finally see. You catch that when you get home. Kept him blind so he could finally see. So, 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 so cheap respect says that I see you, but I don't see you. Yeah. Yeah. Let me give you three things you can look at in somebody's life to tell if they've got some cheap respect. When they act sassy. Sassy is a cute way to be disrespectful and offer cheap respect. All right, all right, all right, all right. Sassy, my wife tells me sometimes, oh, I see you got on your sassy pants. I say, well, I guess I do have my sassy pants. <laughs> this is a cute way to be disrespectful, but to not counsel someone completely out. Let me give you another way is to, is to exaggerate uh, size. And all teenagers say, I'm sorry, Mom, I didn't mean to do that. That's, that's, that's just another little cheap way to, to, to show respect, but to not show respect. Like when someone sees you coming in the door, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you another practical one. It's just dismissive looks. People give dismissive looks as if they are looking through you. But it's a way of disrespect, but showing people that you're trying. At least I'm trying. Look at what Paul asked. He, he, he asked a question, a few questions. Am I not free? Now, these are all rhetorical. Am I not free? Yes. Am I, am I an apostle? Yes. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Well, you have. Are you not the result of the work of the Lord? Well, yes, we are. This is the Corinthians answering back. Even though I may not be an apostle to others, indeed I am to you. Well, that's true. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Yeah, because you preached and we gave our lives to Jesus. Well, that's true. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. The reality of this is, is that Paul is talking to the church. This is the same body of people who at one time loved the world and did not have a hard time showing respect to the world. But because they may have been on Team Cephas or may, Team Apollos, they did not, they were not, all of them are not necessarily on Team Paul. So Paul has to address himself, why are y'all so heavy and sitting on me? As if I am not who I have shown myself to be. You see, he said, sitting on, why y'all sitting on me? It's the picture of, of, of disrespect even in the large church today. As if we want to find something on somebody. Instead of accepting our brother and sister who they are, the way they are, it's as if we talk, well, you can't be nice all the time. He always nice. Well, how come man just can't be nice? I mean, just. Y'all look at it. We're not going to make him another. So, so he, he, he says, uh, verse 6 says, or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to do um, to not work for a living. So even Peter, the first pope, was married. You see the irony of that because now popes don't get married. Okay. All right. So, so, so uh, Paul and Barnabas were the only two of the men that were sent, sent out that did not risk, that were not married and did not receive alms while they were in a particular city. Now, now, get this. So the church is mad at Paul, sitting on Paul because they really didn't want to call him an apostle. But then they're also mad at him because he wasn't taking their money. Yeah, it's my, you, you see, they, they, they didn't want to call him an apostle. They want to call him a true man of God. But then they get mad at him also because he wasn't taking their money. Which one is it? See, this is the problem when people sit on who God has called you to be. First of all, you're not heavy enough to squash down what God has put his hands on. And so whoever God has called you to be, it's going, you're going to walk into that no matter what anybody else says. You ought to give God praise for that. That you can't stop your brother and sister from being who God wants them to be. Isn't that good news? I don't know what y'all are looking for. That's some good news. Can't nobody stop you. And here's the other side of that. You can't stop anybody else. 
You don't have to like them or the situation, but if what God has sanctioned, it is so, right? So Paul is saying, listen, you all offer cheap respect. And at one time, this is the same church that were experiencing the, the, uh, the, 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 the influx of, of the, um, uh, going to the temple of Dionysus, getting drunk. Didn't have a problem with that. But when it's time to sit under authority, we got a problem. Wow. Y'all got to move on, but that's a problem with American church today. We don't like authority. Right. Look at me. Don't give yourself away. Don't give yourself away. Many of us are on the struggle bus because we don't want to submit. Oh, he said it. He said it in church. Submit. <laughs> now, y'all looking at me like I wrote this. I didn't write this. I'm just talking loud. I didn't write it. There is a responsibility of every human being. You're going to have to submit to somebody sooner or later. So why not submit to somebody that's submitted to the same authority that you're submitted to? At least supposed to be. Um, Paul talks about he has rights. The first right that he mentions that he has a right because he is an apostle. Everybody say he's an apostle. So whatever comes his way, he, he has a right to it because he's, he's, he's an apostle. Um, if he wanted to, he could eat or drink anything he wanted to because he was free, Right. He could take a spouse if he wanted to because he was, he's free. Um, he, could, he could shut down his business as a tent maker if he wanted to because he is, he's free. There is a certain amount of freedom that God has given all of his sons and daughters. But get this. If it was to cause another sibling to stumble, Paul was willing to either let it go or not let it go because God's kingdom was more important to him than anything else. So I have to ask, have you thought about what you are willing to let go of for the cause of the kingdom? No, yeah. no, 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 no. I mean, think about it, think about it. That thing that you have longed for, saved up for, prayed for, fasted over, what if God says to you to let it go? Is your brother and sister, do they mean that much to you that you're willing to let it go? That's the problem with the, the Christian church today. We're involved but not committed. <laughs> Listen, we want the things that make us look holy and spiritual. But when it comes to actually walking out spirituality, well, hold on, Reverend, you mean I got to let all this, I mean, I worked hard for this. I planned. My, my, my vision board has, well, what if God says, uh-uh to all of that? Are you involved or are you committed? Pardon me for being personal, but when, when the Lord told uh, me about starting this church, I was like, no. I like what I'm doing. Making good money. Leave me alone. You good? I'm good, God, you know. <laughs> Everybody good. My wife was happy with me. Bills getting paid. I mean, things are good. But here comes God. You act like you involved. I need you to be fully committed. I know it looks good. It feels good. You, I, I, I got it. I got on, on paper. Everything looks wonderful. But your heart is not right because you're not fully committed. Every husband, your wife needs you to be fully committed. Every wife, your husband needs you to be fully committed. As a pastor, if you call yourself a member, I need you to be fully committed. And greater than this local church, the universe church, God needs all his sons and daughters to be fully committed <laughs> to him. But here's the problem. I don't want to submit all the way to authority. Well, that's a problem now. That's a problem. Because um, cheap respect uh, says that, that I cannot live that way. I have to submit myself completely to God. You know what? They even have a, a, a disorder for this. They do. Y'all know I, I, in my playtime I read psychology today. Maybe I shouldn't be doing that. But the, there's a whole disorder called oppositional defiant disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder i call that sin you put it whatever kind of title and it's really in that's why you know because it's in children right uh opposition define disorder that's where i choose to not do what you tell me to do and by right i can make my own decision no you're sinful 
Because when I choose to do something in opposition to what God has said, you can put what kind of disorder name you want to put on it. I'm just full of sin. As a matter of fact, my grandma said, you full of your flush, baby. <laughs> want to diagnose me with an issue? No, the problem is not me having a disorder. The problem with me is that I got my mama and my daddy's blood in me. They got their mama and daddy's blood in them, and I'm just sinful because I want to do it my way when I want to do it. Cheap respect. Say back at me, we got to submit. Jot down your notes, James 4 and 7. He said, well, submit yourselves therefore to God. And once you submit to God, then you now have the power to resist the devil and the devil will flee from you. You see, the devil will not flee from you. You're not walking in the power of submission to God. Cheap respect. You're trying to handle the chaos of this world all by yourself. I don't care how strong you are. Your shoulders are not strong enough to bear the weight of all this drama in this culture. You need the power of supernatural help. And that power is called the Holy Ghost. And he'll keep you if you want to be kept. He'll keep you. He'll keep you. Jot down Hebrews 13 and 17. The writer of Hebrews says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who... Who will, who, who will have to give an account. Submission to spiritual leaders is emphasized right here. Now listen, I'm going to say it one more time, then I'm, I'll move on to the Spirit tell me too. Um, it is impossible for me to be your pastor if God is not your master. Because you will find fault in everything you want to find fault. You know, fault is easy to find when you're looking for it. You'll find fault in everything. Why? Because you haven't fully committed yourself to what you said God said you ought to be. I didn't make nobody give us up to Jesus. That was your choice. And so to give your life to Christ says, now I am in full submission to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. All right, all right. So now, not only is there on the, on the table, Paul says to them, cheap respect. Look in the text. That's what we call cheap labor. I say cheap labor. Verse 7 says this. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law, doesn't the law, excuse me, say the same thing for it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is threading out the grain? Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes, threshes should be able to do it in the hope of sharing in the harvest. Jot down again and write down cheap labor. So we all understand the labor law. Cheap labor is, is labor that's done with the hand, with your hands, um, where the payoff is not that great. Right? It's done with the hand, with your hands, and the payoff is not that great. Paul uh, is saying here to the church, uh, that wherever you put your hands, there is supposed to be a return in your sweat equity financially. Right. Now, this passage is used because Paul is used in many churches to outline the fact that you, all, you give to support those who are supporting you. All right? Is everybody with me so far? Now, when you start talking about money and sex, people get quiet and they get, they, they, they get well, what? I can't, I can't hear the microphone. So listen, listen, listen. If you are on the struggle bus of giving to the large church to support leadership, um, staffing, and all that, we can have a conversation about that. We can. Paul is pretty clear right here what this looks like. So much so that Paul even gives evidence of this in the Old Testament. All right? <laughs> okay, y'all look at him like, oh, okay. So, so, so um, just jot down Deuteronomy 25. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that real quick. Deuteronomy 25. Listen, the point is not you giving to support staffing and all that in the church. That's not the point of this passage. 
But because that's the thing that gets us all rattled up, we lean on that as if that's the only thing the text is saying. It's bigger than that, y'all. <laughs> it's bigger than that. So get this. Paul says, if you have an ox, as Moses said in Deuteronomy, and the ox is on the floor threshing wheat, don't get mad at the ox for eating some wheat while the ox is threshing. Because as the ox eats the wheat, the ox gets stronger and has energy to keep on threshing. Right? So it wouldn't make good sense to put a yoke on the ox to keep the ox from putting his head down to eat. It wouldn't make good sense, right? Because if you let the ox eat, the ox will produce more, right? He says right here, he says, a soldier, no one goes into the army and pays their own way. Now, think about this. In, 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 in Paul's day, they did not enlist for four years. This, is always, this was a 25-year commitment. 25 years. So, 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 the, the, the government took care of the soldiers, much like how we do today. But there was no GI Bill. You can get it. No, no, no. You just put your life on the line. We're going to pay you for it, but that's all you get out of us, right? He, he says, so, if a soldier doesn't pay his own way to the army, a, 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 a farmer doesn't plant grapes and not eat some of the grapes. Right? He, he, right? He, 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 he says, so, so you, 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 a farmer don't plant grapes, eat some of the grapes. He says, look, he says also uh, um, that, they, that, that a, a dairy farmer doesn't have cows and not drink some of the milk. Right? Listen, I don't have time to go down this path, but it's just beautiful how Paul uses the, this, this, these um, illustrations as a, a soldier, a farmer, and all that. Because Jesus does the same thing. We don't have time. We may talk about that on Wednesday. How Jesus talks about the vineyard. You know, it's, it's a whole lot of parallels right there. We ain't going to talk about it tonight. We'll talk about it maybe. Y'all, see y'all Wednesday night. Praise the Lord. We'll talk about that maybe Wednesday. So the, the, the point is this. If there is work done, there should be compensation made for the work. If you don't believe that, if you don't believe that, go to work tomorrow and tell your boss you don't want to ever be paid again. Keep your money. I don't want it no more. Right? And so Paul, in order to help make this make sense to his audience, he now goes back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 24 says, do not muzzle an ox while it is um, threading out the grain. There is no place in the Lord's work for the church to be the culprit of, of receiving cheap labor. What Paul wants us to understand is that Paul is supposed to receive, yet Paul makes the choice not to. That's the picture. So, part of a big person again, we we'll started the church. I didn't start receiving anything from the church. What was I, 10, 12 years later, 15 years later? But get this. If my family was on the struggle bus because of that, it was my decision. Right? I don't want anybody to feel bad. You know, we learned some things in that. I learned how to, how to, how to make gourmet hot dogs. Why well, y'all real saved this morning? When you, when, you, when you don't have what you need, you learn how to be improvised. You know how to make some things happen. Learn how to stretch those beans in the wind. Okay. All right. All right. All right. But it's my choice. If I was to receive or would not receive, listen, it's, it's your choice to give or receive. But don't be guilty of having cheap labor. This is, Paul was more concerned about this church hearing what he had to say versus him receiving any money, any alms from them. That's why Paul kept his business. He kept on making tents. He wanted to make sure that this church could hear what he had to say about the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's, that's why I kept on trying to play the piano and lead worship. I made money that way so I wouldn't have to be a drain on the church. Isn't that something? But here it is. It was my choice. The same freedom that we have in Christ gives us the freedom to say yes and no. The reality is many of us are saying no where we ought to be saying yes. 
and saying yes where we ought to be saying no. Why is that? Because I like being involved and not committed. So Paul offers, well, I'm putting on all your heart as cheap labor. He's an apostle. He started the church. He quotes the Old Testament to prove the fact that he is deserving of it. But to make a bigger lesson, he makes the choice not to receive. Therefore, I ask the question again, what are you willing to give up? For the cause of your brother and your sister. And all of Paul's, Paul's um, his, part of his Paulinian theology is talking about having an interest in, in, in others more than yourself. Being willing to bear the burden of your brother and your sister. How much are you willing to bear? How much interest are you willing to give about others versus yourself? Look at verse number 11. He says, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, it is, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have the right, this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Jot down and put down um, cheap support. Cheap support. Paul has the right to receive. And yet he makes the conscious decision not to receive. He says, we put up with a whole lot of stuff from you guys. Remember, they, they, they really didn't like Paul. They questioned his authority. Uh, if we had time, we can go back to the first three sermons, two sermons we talked about. They didn't even like how Paul looked. Paul had a crook in his nose. He didn't even look the part. They said some theologians say that he was not needed and pigeon toed. He's just an ugly joker. And so these Corinthians, because they were a part of the, the hierarchy of there in, in Corinth, they didn't even like the way this man looked. They didn't like the way he spoke. Luke talks about it in the book of Acts. They didn't like the way he spoke. And so they will, if they, they found the cause to have the issue with Paul. Paul says, I put up with a whole bunch of stuff with y'all. <laughs> but because I want you to hear what I have to say, I'm willing to digress and not take what is actually mine so you will hear the message about Jesus. So, so here's one of our problems, and we're almost, here's one of our problems, is that many of us have made the choice not to digress in any way. And we don't even care. There are people who are following you. Watching what you post. Listening to how you talk to others. And we still say what we want to say. Because I'm American. Land on the free home on the brave. I can say what I can care. It's about God and guns. Oh, I mean, really? I mean, that's what we. Because we don't even care about the message of the cross. We care more about our personal message and our personal brand than we do the cause of Christ. I know it's right. I know it's right. And, I, and so Paul says, You can, I have dealt with your cheap support. And I'm still not going to diminish the message of the gospel. You've been ugly toward me. You talked about me. You, all this stuff, but I am still going to deny my pocketbook. Because I want you to hear the message of Jesus. Man, man. So I have to ask a question. What, maybe y'all tired of me asking. Ask your neighbor, what are you willing to give up? Maybe y'all tired of me asking. So ask somebody, what are you willing to give up? What, what are you willing to give up? I mean, it. If the Spirit of the Lord said to you, really clear in the clear voice, say to, to give up your retirement plan and give it to a needy um, widow. <laughs> Some of y'all will be, Pastor, uh, can we pray tonight? What are we going to, why you got to come in and pray? What? And I mean, I'm t listen, Paul is not just in, in, involved, he's committed to this thing. How committed are you? 
Listen, 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 listen. listen. When, I, when, when I got married, I had to learn this was a full commitment. There was an expectation of me to be fully committed. And more than being married to my wife, when I gave my life to Jesus, there is an expectation from God for me to be fully committed to him and his word. And I'm just saying in 2024, the day is really over for us to be only involved with God. He wants you to be fully committed. Hasn't he been fully committed to us? When we could even trust our own self, God placed some trust within us. When we were consistently going around the same mountain doing the same silly thing, did God ever turn his back on us? So why would we question our commitment to God now when you were out in the world, you didn't have a problem with paying whatever you had to pay? That's just what it is. Y'all, let's go. But when it comes to the Lord's house, oh, I got to tell you, I always talk about money. Well, there's an offering in every service, y'all. I mean, I mean. But if you want to find a problem, you can find a problem. But if you want to an answer, go to the word. So Paul knew the audience that was around him. So he was not just going to rely on his word. He went and used his Moses words to qualify the support that was needed. Look at verse number 13. Um, Don't you know that those who serve at the temple get their food from the temple? That those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. All right, y'all. I didn't write that one. Let's read verse 14 again. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Now, can we be honest this morning? The reason why many saints sit on the struggle bus with this is because we have a lot of actors out there. There are a lot of actors out there. Not just on television. They're in some local churches. Some actors. Uh, Some leaders. Some pastors. And I would call them actors. Um, When you put a plea to help you buy a jet, you acting. And that's play play. That's, that's for real dope play play. Um, when, when, when you put a plea out there to beg from God's people for something that is not necessary for the kingdom's work, you're acting. And so now when you come to a church like this one and many others where you have an offering and then sometimes you may have a special ask to be given. Well, I don't know. I got to give up. It's because we have seen so many actors. And, and they get a following. It blows my mind. I don't know. I'm too scary to try. I feel like if I get on. Listen, I, love, I can't ride in a regular airplane because I can't be around sinners. I mean. <laughs> I'd be too scared to say that out loud, you know what I mean? I'm like, you know, it, it, it just don't look right. Something wrong with that, y'all. Just, because they're acting. You see, what we know about God is God does not base what he does for you based on what you give to him. I'm going to try this again. God does not base what he does to, for you off of what you give to him. When we give, it is strictly out of an act of obedience. Everybody say voluntary obedience. obedience. Say it again, voluntary obedience. That we all have been given the opportunity to give. You can call it sowing a seed. You can call it giving the first, whatever you want to call it. But it is an opportunity to give to God's work. If you want to. And if it. Because it is an act of obedience, 
If I don't do it, that means it's an action of disobedience. All right, all right. Now, what, what, do you see how, how Paul does this in this conversation? So Paul goes back to the, to the Israelites, and he says what I just read. Did you not know that those who serve in the temple got their food from, from the labor? So we all understand, we will understand for sure, that there was a, a gross nat, um, national uh, response of 10%. Everybody say 10%. Of the national receipts in were given to the work of the temple, the work of the church. When the church in the work of the temple, God's God's people, right? Then you have everybody say, um, everybody say chula. Everybody say it strong chula. chula. All right. So that is an offering that was also given um, of every twenty four pieces of bread, every twenty four um, cakes that were made. One of twenty four was given to the Levites. One of 24 was given to the Levites. Uh, and if you, if you had a business, it was once of every 48 were given to the temple. Hmm. Let me start adding this together. Uh, everybody say um, terama. Say it strong. You, you're speaking Hebrew. Say terama. I read that. So, so that, that, that was a, a crop gift of one of every 50. So you have 10%, you got about 2%, another 1% was given automatically as a response to God's word for the furthering work of the temple. All right. Now, if the sacrificial offering system was working the way it should be working, you have, everybody say five offerings. So you have, um, you have the burn offering, everybody say burn offering. You have the grain offering, and you have the peace offering. Those three offerings were voluntary. So you did not have to give in those three offerings. But there were two offerings that you had to give in. One was the sin offering, and one was the trespass offering. All right? So these things that were offered after, the, the, after they, they burned the cow, whatever was left, went to the priest. Now, I'm not saying this. Paul is using this as an illustration to understand that it is the work of the Lord's people to take care of those who preach who declare God's word. And if you are using God's gift, there is a response that comes back to you too. But here's the deal. We don't do this. Paul didn't do this to get anything from the people. Paul had a calling to preach the gospel. Paul was not willing to allow receiving anything from God's people to diminish his voice and the value of the message of the gospel. So I have to ask you again, what are you willing to give up? Although you are deserving of it. What are you willing to walk away from although you worked hard to prepare for it? What are you willing to walk away from for the cause of the gospel message? So please don't get lost in the fact of, of giving money to support the preacher. Ah, don't get lost in that. Don't get lost in it. Because the big picture is Paul shows us what free liberty really looks like. Paul shows us what, what, it, what it really means to depend on God because he said no to anything they had to offer. Woo! Look at verse 15 and we're about done. Um... But I have not used any of these rights. Wow. And I'm not writing this in the hope that you will uh, do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me. If I do not preach the gospel, if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge. And so not to make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. 
All right, here's my final point, if you will. Just jot this down, if you will. Um, there should be rich boasting. So we have all these areas of, 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 of cheapness that we talked about. But let's close this out with, 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 with a joyful moment and reality for, reality for many of us. That there should be rich boasting, not in our approach to the text, not in being able to speak clearly, but for the fact that God has made choice of us to declare the goodness of who he is, that's what we boast in. That's what we boast in. So it, it's, it's not about in your training. And I believe everybody ought to be trained. There are some things that you learn in class about orientation uh, and things you learn about putting certain sentences together. There's some, some great hints and tad bits along the way. But if God, yet if God called you, God gives you the message, now it's upon you to find the right tools to help grow the system inside of you. But it's not on anybody telling me that I can because God called me. <laughs> it's not on anybody telling me, man, you can really, no, no, I'm cool, I like, thank you for, I appreciate the encouragement. But God called me. See, this is the kind of boasting we have to have in our lives. That it matters not what anybody else says, God called me. You have to be so affirmed in your spirit that if nobody shows up when it's time for you to preach, it's okay because God called me. Uh -huh. See, when we first got started, I told y'all there would be seven people. I would set up, we would set up a hundred chairs every Sunday. And I'd pour some oil and pray over every chair, knowing only seven was going to show up. And two of them would be asleep. But every Sunday, praying, because I knew that in God's time, and God was in somebody to sit in that seat. So it was not on me to choose when to pray. All I had to do was to believe what God said. And if I believe what God said, it does not matter how long it takes. I choose to trust God. And God has given all of us the message, the message of Jesus Christ. So now how you tell the message, how you wrap it around, that's upon you. But the message does not change per person. It's the same message that Christ came. He lived. He died. But on that Sunday morning, he rose in power. That's the gospel message. And all of us have been taxed to share the message of Christ. Paul knew my purpose of living was to preach the gospel. You understand? Let's take a little bit further. Yes, it was Paul's message to preach the gospel. And without question, it's our responsibility to live the gospel. God has not called, echoed everybody in here to preach God's word from a platform like this. But God has called everybody, if you have accepted Christ as your savior, to walk out the gospel of Christ in your life. You have a choice to make today. Will you be satisfied being involved or are you willing to take the next step to get fully committed? Because God needs you to open up your mouth and to declare the praise of him who brought you out of darkness and into the light. The day is over for a silent witness. The day is over for you to be a witness. Praying over your lunch with one eye open, one eye closed. No, no, no. God needs you to stand up and de boldly declare who God is in your life. So I challenge you today to not be cheap. I'm challenging you today to not half do it for God. There are people that are in your sphere of influence that don't need you to be halfway in and halfway out. I don't have been saying it since Christ left, but it's sooner now he's on his way back. So we should not be wasting time placating with people. Yeah. Trying to look the part. Trying to sound the part. But we're not living the part. Yeah. You may not have been called to stand to declare God's word to preach for him. But if you have a temple Christ as your savior, you have been called to live the gospel out. Yeah. 
So I have to ask you one more time, and I think I'll be done today. What are you willing to give up to declare the truth of who Jesus is? Many of us are on the struggle bus because we have talked so much about dumb stuff that nobody wants to hear anything else we have to say. We're all lying, got an opinion about everything under the sun. And when it's time for us to tell somebody about Christ, no, man, I don't want to hear about that. I heard what you said last week. It's a political time of the year. Got a whole bunch of Christian dummies doing a whole lot of talking already. If you vote this way, going to hell. Thank you, Mother Year. <laughs> if you vote this way, you can't be a Christian, you're going to hell. And the sad part about that is that we are allowing that type of rhetoric at the Lord's house. Do you really believe that God cares who wins the presidency? Do you really believe that God, that God cares who wins the Super Bowl? But we pray as if, if it doesn't happen this way, the world is coming to an end. Listen, every presidential election is always coming to an end. Everybody got one more thing to say. It's coming to an end, y'all. Jesus is coming back. Listen, he's coming back not because this other person won. He's coming back because he said he would. <laughs> and we're putting all this stock into being here in America. You understand that America is not any end-time prophecy. I'm American. So what? You ought to be boasting, I'm a Christian. So when I am done on this side, I will live forever eternally with the father that's the gospel that we declare i'm not a black republican a black democrat no man i'm a christian ah it's not it's it's just christ and christ alone as a matter of fact on the christ the solid rock i stand all of the ground is sinking sand why because i am fully committed I'm not going to be satisfied just being involved, but I'm going to give all of who I am to who Jesus is. Christ shows us what it looks like to walk in full submission. I thank God for Paul. Paul gives this Corinthian church a livable example. They can really look at him and tell that there's something different about this guy. And I appreciate Paul. I appreciate Peter's my dude. I appreciate Peter. But you know what? Both of them were natural men. And they had their own bents and issues with their own selves, right? But y'all, there is a model that came to show us what full submission looks like. There is a model that came to show us what it looks like to walk in obedience to his father even when he had an issue. On that cross, he said, Father... If it's your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine will be done. Christ shows us what full submission is because he was committed to the work of his father. So I'm done. If there's anybody this morning, you have made up in your mind that you're going to be fully committed to God. Why don't you say something out loud? God, I'll be fully committed. See, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. But when you understand who God is and all that God has done for you and who God is in your life, you all not be so and saying, God, I will be fully committed. I don't know all the things God has brought you through. I don't know all the things God has brought you over. But I can look at your forehead and tell you that he's been good to you. I can look at your eyes and say, God's been good to you. I can look at your body and see how well you're dressed and I can ascertain on my own that God's been good to you. I don't have to know your full story. I don't have to know all about your life, but I know one thing for sure is that God has been good to me. And if there's anybody here that's not ashamed to declare, yes, I believe you preach up. God's been good. I'm not ashamed to declare this morning, God's been good. He's been good to me. Let the Redeemer of the Lord say something this morning. If you know he's been good, don't wait on nobody else. 
when I consider all the ways God has brought me through, when I think of his goodness and everything he's done for me, something happens on the inside every now and again that I don't mind telling him thank you. I don't mind waving my hands. I don't mind telling him I love you because he's been so good, so good, so good so good to me i'm done but early that sunday morning he showed us the model because he rose from the dead with all power in the power of his hands power 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 that same power has been given to all of us that we can walk out this gospel of jesus Yes, I can have the freedom to go and drink if I want to. I can have the freedom to do this if I want to, but I choose not. If it becomes a stumbling block for you, my brothers and my sisters. Paul said, I can take it, but I have no problem taking it, but I choose not to take it. Because I don't want it to be a stumbling block for you to hear about Jesus. What are you willing to give up? For the message of the cross to be heard. What are you willing to die to? For the message of the cross to be heard. It's a challenge not just for me. I've been struggling with this for a long time. trying Because I knew this passage was coming. What am I willing to give up? For the cause of Jesus. And listen, listen, if you're like me, you can't use what you did in the past as an excuse not to do something today. There's a demand in all of our lives to continue to offer our lives to him as a living sacrifice. So if you know him as your savior, this, this is... This is all of us. We got to make a choice, y'all. I mean, are we going to trust God to walk out the scriptures? Are we going to pick and choose, you know, what we do, how hard I go in? Or we will be fully committed. That chicken could offer egg today, offer egg tomorrow. That same chicken could offer egg next week. But that pig was fully committed. And whenever the meat was gone, the meat was gone. But that pig was willing to put his life on the line. How committed are you? Bow with me now in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. For the example, for the model that Christ showed us, what it looks like to live in in full submission, being submitted doesn't mean it's going to make sense to me or anybody else, but the just shall live by faith, not by our understanding. So, Father, I pray for all my brothers and sisters that are here this morning that we will literally submit completely to your authority. Not to an idea or a system, but to you completely, which says, I don't have to have all the answers. But I choose the answer. And his name is Jesus. I'm not suggesting to you that when you do that, life is going to balance itself. Everybody's going to like it. That's not reality. But when you are fully committed to Christ, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. Your voluntary obedience is to God and God alone. 
So if you know him as your Savior, God is demanding more out of you. Full commitment. It's interesting how we can be fully committed to a whole lot of stuff. Lifelong cowboy fans, lifelong Lakers, you know, we're fully committed to all this. And when it comes to the things of God, we can find ourselves being slow for. I pray for some giddy up in us today. And we'll fully submit ourselves to him. So I'm going to ask you, if you know him as your Savior, you know that God is demanding more out of you. Will you just take a moment to spend some time with God? Just take some moment, spend some time with him. Because whatever you have, God has entrusted that in you. And silence can no longer be the loudest voice of your life. never given your life to Jesus so he'll be to be your personal Lord and Savior there's no salvation in these aisles but when you come down it is a sign and we want to celebrate with you for the commitment you are making to him to not just be involved with him but to be fully committed to him you have the freedom Say yes or no. But it's my prayer that you will say yes to Jesus. Come on, preachers. There's nothing better than knowing Jesus.